I'd like to welcome everybody that is here with us tonight and also those on Zoom. We appreciate you being here and also uh, would appreciate your input. If you have questions, feel free to ask. Uh, we have tonight we have Kathy McGann. She is a specialist on, on pets and preparedness uh, for your pets in case of an emergency. And she'll tell a little bit more about herself to us as as we start out here, but we always like to start with a word of prayer. We're going to have Christy Myers say, say that prayer for us, and after that, Kathy, it's, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Our dear, kind, gracious Heavenly Father, we're so very grateful to be here as a community and to help support each other and to help support our area. We're grateful that Kathy was willing to um, speak uh, tonight and to take some of her time to share some of the knowledge so that we can um, learn and benefit from her. Please help us to remember this and please bless that she'll be able to have my spirit with her and that she'll be comforted as she speaks. Please bless that everything will go well and when the time comes, we'll be able to make it home safely. We say these things humbly in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let me know when you're ready for me to take her. I'll give her you back can hold her as long I'll as give her back to you. She's going to stay to the crate demo. I'll have you come up and bring your crate. All right. Thanks, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, I've been enjoying the series so far. And so um, thanks for having me to talk on this topic. And um, so tonight we're going to talk about animal preparedness. And um, I'm going to break it down into a couple of different categories. Hi, little buddy. So we're going to talk about domestic animals, companion animals, like dogs, cats, and horses. Then we're also going to talk about livestock a little bit, like goats, chickens, cattle, things like that. Um, and then we're going to break it down into two other categories as well. Um, uh, Short-term, like evacuation, like in the event of a fire or something like that. And then long-term preparedness. Um, so that's, that's our topic for this evening. So... Um, Oh, I guess I should tell you a little bit more about me. Um, I'm retired. I love it. Um, I am a veterinarian. Um, so I had a long career. I started off um, working with horses and then I went into small animal. So those are, those are my areas that um, I'm most familiar with. Livestock is a little bit out of my comfort zone, but we'll talk about it anyway. Um, so this little guy, hi, can I say hi? Yeah, you're going to be a demo dog tonight. Yeah, what do you think? Are you okay? Yeah, you're nervous, aren't you? It's going to be all right. Okay, so um, what my motto always is, is um, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. This was um, a recent trip to um, Valley of Fire in Nevada. If, if you guys haven't been there, it's really kind of a cool place. And you can see we're on horseback there. And so it was a wonderful day and great weather and good company and scenery is spectacular. So this is, this is hoping for the best. Um, we'll go on. Oh, let's see, I already talked about that. So this is the bad Valley of Fire. So I moved here in late October and five days after I got here, this was what we had. That was a picture of the fire just outside of Diamond Valley. We were on a pre-alert evacuation order. I had halfway unpacked my stuff. I kind of, you know, I went out, it was like eight o'clock at night, it was dark. I hooked up the horse trailer, I was trying to find everything and um, could not find my cat carrier. Looked everywhere. Oh, he wants you back. I'll get him back in a second. Here you go. Okay. Um, could not find my cat carrier anywhere. I was in a panic. I was like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? So I had met two people since I moved here five days ago. And uh, they were gracious. They're here in the watching tonight. They were gracious enough to come over and calm my nerves and bring their cat carrier for me in case I needed it. Luckily, we didn't have to evacuate, but... You know, it was scary. We might have had to. So a local event like that, um, you know, it's going to be where you're not going to be 
hurting for food or, you know, needing um, any kind of long-term preparedness, right? It's going to affect our local area. You could probably go, you know, 15 miles down the road and it, it, everything's going to be fine. You know, you're going to have relatives, you're going to have friends, you're going to have people that can help you out with food and, and shelter and things like that. So what you're going to need to do though with your animals is you're going to need to get them out, right? You're going to need to have a trailer, you're going to need to have carriers, you're going to need to have leashes, um, all that sort of thing is what you're going to need to prepare for. Probably water is a good idea. Um, since I'm from Montana, water's not such a big deal. You know, we don't, I don't take water in my horse trailer when I go places in Montana because there's water everywhere. Down here, a water in your car and your trailers would be the thing to, you know, to have. I'd worry less about food and more about how you're going to transport the animals and get them to a safe place. So that brings us to this flame height picture over here. Um, so I have a friend who works for the fire lab in, uh, in Missoula and I asked her, I said, so what's the, what size of a dry lot would be safe if you wanted to leave your livestock like sheltering in place, if you had cattle or horses or whatnot, could you leave them, you know, in your arena, let's say, and not evacuate them? Or let's say you weren't home and, you know, you couldn't get them in the trailer and the neighbors maybe could, you know, put them in the arena for you. Is that safe? There's actually a formula for this. It's more for people, but it should work for animals too. Um, so you take the flame height times four, and that's the radius of the dry lot that you need for the animals to be safe from, um, you know, the smoke and the heat. It's not the flames that's, gonna, that's going to get them. It's the smoke and the heat. So... And I kept asking her, I said, well, what's the average flame height? Is it like 100 feet? And she's like, it depends. I'm like, is it 50 feet? She says, it depends. So basically, you're not going to have time to calculate the flame height if there's a fire, is what I, my takeaway from this was. Um, you would need a really big dry lot. I don't think an arena uh, or something like that is going to be safe. Basically, if you had a flame height of 100 feet, times four, that's 400 feet, that's the radius. So you need an 800 foot by 800 foot dry lot for your animals to be safe if that was the flame height. That's a really big area. I've seen one place in Diamond Valley that's that big. It's that adobe house over in the north, you know, the north side of Diamond Valley that has a really big fenced dry lot. I don't know who lives there, but- South. Yeah, oh, south, yeah, thanks. Right, <laughs> south, that way. Um, anyway, that, that would probably be a safe place to leave livestock, but you know, an arena, anything like that, that I've seen around here, I don't think is big enough. So, you know, your best bet is to get your horses, your cows out. Um, so that's where that little flame height thing comes from. All right. Um, our companion animals. So things to have at the ready, you know, so that you can, because you don't know where you're going to be going, right? You know, you're going to be leaving here, but where are you going to go? You know, you might have relatives, their dog might not like your dog. You know, it's the horses might have to stay tied to the trailer. You might not have, you know, a, a corral situation wherever you're going to be evacuated to. So you have to plan ahead for that. So things that you'll need, leashes, crates, your carrier, trailers. I like this little portable, that, uh, this black thing here. This guy is a little portable electric fence, which works great for containing livestock. Yeah, you just have to have the posts and the, and the cord, but it's battery operated. So you just plug in a couple of uh, D cell batteries and it runs for hours and hours and hours. Um, so that's a handy little piece of kit to have. So like a portable corral, port electric fence, all those things um, might be important where you're going, where you're evacuating to, okay? Other things you should have with you or, you know, I hate to use the term like bug out bag for your pets because that sounds like you're a criminal, like running from the law, but, you know, you should have them in your truck or have a bag or have, have something maybe ready in the case of evacuation or at least maybe a list um, of what you need because you know us as the adults you know we kind of have an idea what we need but what if you guys aren't home 
what if it's the kids that are trying to get things ready or you know your 16 or 17 year old adult but hasn't had to you know make these kinds of decisions before this might be something you want to practice or discuss um so anyway things other things that you might want to take with you yes so this actually happened to us during that same fire my wife and i were in california and the kids were home and we hear the evacuation notice and we're like okay what do we do with our goats our chickens our dogs everything and what do we do to try and get our and the kids are worried about what they need and not the animals and, and then it's like where is everything just like you said yeah where's the cat carrier? where's the cat carrier what are you going to do how are you going to get the goats out yeah so it's good to have a plan and it's good to you know remember how we used to have to practice fire drills like in school do they still do that i don't know but it's good to have a family practice. And I think we had, what, four or five fires last year? Yeah, I know. There were a lot. And the drought, there's going to probably be more. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good point. Thanks, guys. Um, so anyway, other things that you might need, again, because you don't know where you're going to be going, is um, some sort of um, a paper. You know, it's good to have it on your phone too, but if the cell service goes out or whatnot, it's good to have paper documents as well as maybe, you know, pictures on your phone. So have a handout with info about your pet, um, microchip numbers, a picture, you know, what if you get separated from, you know, like your little dog or cat or whatever. Um, that's a good thing to have. Um, yeah, photo of the pet, microchip number, um, your contact information, or if you have relatives in the area, put their contact information down there too. Um, um, some sort of a, of a handout with any boarding instructions. Maybe your pets need to go to a boarding facility. Like I said, maybe you have relatives in the area, but their dog doesn't like your dog. Your dog's not welcome at their house. So you might have to, you know, board them at the kennel or at the vet's office. So, you know, have copies of the vaccine records, have, um, any pertinent medical history, if they're on medication, you know, have an extra vial of their thyroid medication or whatever it might be that they're taking long term in their little bug out bag so that you have it there and you're not like, oh, we forgot Fluffy's medication, you know? So things like that are, you know, a good thing to have all coordinated. Um, okay, so livestock. We talked about how Sheltering in place is probably not the best idea in the event of a fire. Um, I can't really think of any other short-term evacuation scenarios. I mean, we're not really in an earthquake or flood or anything like that. I mean, who knows what might happen, but a fire would be the most likely scenario. So you're probably going to need to get your animals out, get them somewhere. So again, if you have, like people with horses generally have a horse trailer, but people with goats or, you know, a lot of people around here do roping. Um, so they might have, you know, five or six steers. Well, do they have a trailer for the steers and for the horses? Um, can they get everybody out? You know, is, is, are the adults out of town and the kids have to deal with it on short notice? Again, you know, just something to think about, something to talk about. What are you gonna do? If, if I'm not home, what if I'm on a ride uh, with one of my horses and I'm, an hour away, or I'm at the Valley of Fire, you know, two hours away, and something catastrophic happens while well, I'm out of town. What about my other two horses? Who's gonna, you know, it's a lot to expect a neighbor to come evacuate your two horses while they're worried about their own self and their livestock, right? And I've got my truck and trailer, I'm off on a ride somewhere. So what are you gonna do? Well, you know, you might have to turn them loose. Um, again, we meet with the fire department and the forest service every year up in Missoula in my neighborhood. And if that's the, if that's, if you can't get the animals out, turning them loose is their best chance of surviving. Cause if they get, if they're stuck in a small paddock or in a stall and the fire comes sweeping through the neighborhood and the structures are on fire, you know, they're not going to make it. So turning them loose might be your best option. Um, um, and then that brings me to, I don't know if you can see it here, but this is part of the problem. There's a lot of down barbed wire, you know, in our uh, neighborhood. You can't even really see it here. It's, it's a down fence and there's barbed wire in that upper picture. Um, but that's the problem if the animals need to be turned loose. Down barbed wire is really, really dangerous. Um, it's still attached to the fence posts, but they're laying on the ground, so you can't really see it very well. 
uh, if an animal gets their legs stuck in that, you know, they're not going to get free from it because the fence posts are, st it's still attached to the posts. So they're going to get all cut up and fight with themselves. And, you know, they're already in a panic if there's a fire. Anyway, that's not a good scenario. Um, the up barbed wire, you know, at least they have a chance of seeing it as a fence and, and avoiding it. But the down barbed wire is pretty dangerous. So I was going to put in a plug for maybe some sort of community project to have a wire roll up and get rid of the down barbed wire. You know, even if you just cut it off of the down fence posts and, and leave it there, at least then it's on the ground. It's not as dangerous. It's not attached to anything. They're not going to get their legs stuck in it. Um, so that's that's one thing that we as a community might might think about doing. Um, this is one of my horses sticking his head out of the of, uh, little trailer there on his way to a pack trip. He loves to go. Um, anyway, so yeah, uh, think about um, having um, stuff with you in the trailer, water buckets and jugs of water. Um, again, you might need to have something for a 12 hour period till you can get, you know, resupplied. Have some food if you can. Just remember to prioritize. Water is going to be your first priority. Food second. Well, safety first, then water, then then food. Okay, let's move on. What do we got next? Oh, we talked about this a little bit. Um, you know, what if you're not home? What if you've got a pet sitter? What if your teenage kids are the ones at home because you're out of town overnight or whatever? Um, what if cell service is down? You know, what are you going to do? We're so used, used to now being able to call people to help, right? What are you going to do if cell service goes down? Well, you got to have a plan. You know, we get, we're a great community here. Everybody's super friendly, know your neighbors and, you know, um, have a, have a, have a backup plan. Um, you know, get the dogs out, turn the horses loose, say, Hey, Kyle, get the dogs out, turn the horses loose. And he says to me, Hey, Kathy, you know, stuff the goats in your trailer and, <laughs> and don't worry about the chicken, turn the chickens loose. You know, it's just, it can be a simple plan, but there, there should be, you know, maybe some cooperation and maybe a plan. Um, okay, good. All right. So now we're going to talk about a little bit more about long-term preparedness. Uh, this is an interesting topic to me because as Fred can tell you, I'm probably better at being able to deal with horses and, and dogs and cats than I am at trying to prepare a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> so I'd be perfectly happy if like, you know, the grid went down and we had no more electronics and no more cell service. Um, so, but not everybody feels that way. So anyway, uh, but I like this topic. Okay. So food, food for your animals. You know, the good thing about food for animals is that it kind of already comes like built to last, right? It's not gonna spoil. You know, your dog food, your cat food comes in cans or, you know, prepackaged bags as dry food that is already preserved. Um, so that part's really easy. Hay, again, for your livestock you know, is, is not going to go bad in six months or whatever. You're going to be able to store that. But the awkward part is, is that it takes up space, especially hay. Um, you know, you've got to have a place to store it. Um, if so, if you've got six months of hay um, to get, like so they say, through the winter, that's, you know, money invested and um, storage space invested. So, your garage. yeah, because yeah. like all my half, I only have one car in my garage because the other half is, is full of hay. <laughs> 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 and the dog food, you know, I like, uh, I get my, I just am kind of lazy. And so I just order everything online now. And so, yeah, the man shows up, he brings me my dog food. And I'm like, yay, the dogs run out and greet the UPS guy and everybody's happy. Um, so, but this is interesting because, um, you know, how much food, how much food do you guys stockpile for yourselves? Do you guys have an answer? Like for six months or 
three months or a year, try a year or two. Yeah. Anybody else stockpile food for the family? Two years. Yeah. Two years. Can you imagine having two years worth of hay? You know, I mean, that'd be a lot of hay. I'd need a whole nother, I, you know, yeah, that's a lot of hay. And, um, you know, luckily, well, you know, who knows if we'd be able to get hay you know, in the event of a situation. Um, I mean, goats are good browsers. My horses actually will browse too. But if everybody turns our animals loose and lets them browse, then pretty soon we're not gonna have any browse left either. So it's an interesting topic, like how much hay should you store? You know, I usually do six months. Yeah, at least. Um, Cause that can at least get you through winter until stuff's growing again. But down here, there's not that much graze. There's browse, but there's not that much graze. So something to think about for livestock. Animals are pretty easy. You know, again, their food doesn't really spoil. So it's just a matter of planning ahead and buying two years worth of dog food. I would probably just buy the normal dog food that you normally feed if you can afford it and not switch to like a cheaper brand. Um, and then just rotate it through, you know, just like you would for yourself. Just um, put, you know, put the new stuff in the back and keep the keep the old stuff coming through and just feed it like regular. Okay. One quick thing on that. Yeah. We, we did stock up on some animal stuff that the mice got to it. So we just got the still garbage cans and then stocked pile it in there. So yeah, that's a good, good point. Yeah. Is that sometimes if it's not canned food, if it's the bags, Right. Well, your animals themselves, like my cat broke into the cat food bag. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Easily. And and mice and pack rats and whatever. Those, those still garbage cans and ground pork really nice. So you might want to store it in a safer, you know, more contained place. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Thank you. Um, water storage. Don't you all, don't you guys all wish you had one of these? I love this. <laughs> that's that's Kirk's water truck. He told me it holds uh, thirteen thousand gallons. Wow. Yeah, that 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 would save you for a little while, huh? I have the little five gallon jugs, like the one up in the corner, um, which is better than nothing. Right. But uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, Fred was <laughs> laughing at me, or not laughing. He was like amazed when I told him that the horses drink about ten gallons a day each. So, you know, yeah, so 30 gallons a day just for my three horses. That's a lot compared to what, you know, your dog is going to drink or you yourself are going to drink or your family is going to use. So, um, you know, luckily here in Diamond Valley, we've got such a good water system. I didn't even realize it that most everybody's on a gravity feed. I think I might be one of the only ones that has a pump that I have to pump water up to my house. So, um, but, you know, I know there's a backup um, generator and whatnot to run the pumps to get the water to the tanks. But again, that might be six months worth. Yeah. yeah. And so at some point, you know, water might, might become an issue. So it's good to have a variety of sizes of containers. If you can have your own water storage tank or truck or something like that, you know, that's great. Not everybody can afford that kind of thing. Um, be, be careful about the blue-green algae around here because it can grow in containers as well if it gets sunlight. So you want containers that the sunlight can't get to. And then you should be fine. <clears throat> you could chlorinate it, you could filter it and, and render it safe for like us to drink, but that if it, it, that doesn't get rid of the toxins from the blue-green algae. That gets rid of like bacteria and giardia and things like that. Um, but like boiling doesn't get rid of the toxins. So the toxins are a different thing. That's um, more, and I'm not an expert on this, but it's more like activated charcoal or things like that that can get rid of toxins. Like boiling doesn't do it and filtering doesn't do it. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, maybe we can have another talk on that. <laughs> okay, so, oh, and uh, the other thing about containers is that, um, again, you know, um, the husband or the man of the house might be able to lift a big container, but what if he's out, you know, hunting or getting firewood or doing something else? 
you might want to have a variety of containers that are, you know, that everybody in the house can lift because they, they're heavy. You know, you try to lift a five gallon jug. I mean, it's pretty heavy. You might want to have a lot of little one gallon jugs or little Gatorade bottles or, you know, a variety of sizes. Um, if you have to go like up to the well, you know, to get water and bring it back. Um, so that's just another, another idea. Okay. Ah, first aid kit. You see, I left this blank. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of this is going to depend on your situation, uh, what kind of animals you have, and what your skill level is. Like, my first aid kit is ridiculous. I have everything, you know. I have surgical stapler. I know. I've got lidocaine. I've got. I don't have the herbals. No, I don't have the herbals. But uh, you know. But if you can't give your animal an injection, like you're afraid to, or you don't know how, there's no point in having a bottle of injectable banamine for your livestock. So kind of depends. You know what you're. What you feel comfortable using. Um, basic stuff like, you know, antibiotic ointment and bandage material and, and things like that are a good thing to have. And a lot of it can um, double for what you would use for yourself too. So um, that's, um, and then, yeah, Fred's going to talk more about what you can, you know, use in the local environment, like juniper berries and things like that. So, but that, that's a whole nother talk. Okay, so we'll move on from that. Um, so animals, um, well, there was a talk, the one guy did the talk earlier on um, how to, you know, like how you lose heat. Like we don't have to worry about severe cold around here or severe heat um, for that matter. But, you know, animals do get cold. They have a better ability to regulate their body temperature than we do as humans. They have their fur coat. You know, they can fatten up in the winter and not care. Like their jeans don't fit or whatever. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, they'll need less feed if they can be kept dry and kept out of the wind. Okay. They'll eat less. They can stay warm if they have enough, if they have enough groceries and they have their long winter coat, but they're going to eat more that way. So, you know, if you want to cut down on the amount that they eat, provide them some shelter, keep them warm, keep them dry in the winter, that kind of thing. Same with the summer, um, you know, they're gonna need shade um, and plenty of water. So, um, you know, just, just a few things about shelter for, for the animals. That's my little Mustang, that's Honey Bee. She's the only one that comes up to me. Yeah, the others are like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> All right, so shelter. And animals can, they need to be warm, but they can also provide us with warmth right? That's one of their benefits. If we don't have electricity and don't have heat in our homes, it's going to be a three dog night, right? Yeah, I'm going to be cuddling. I'm going to be cuddling with those guys. Yeah, they're nice and warm. They're toasty. <laughs> Even the little ones, you know, they can keep your feet warm. Yeah. All right. So they need to stay warm, but they can also provide us with warmth. So which brings us to our next topic. This is probably my favorite topic of the whole thing is in the long term situation. Our animals can help us. Right. We might have to go back to like 100 years ago when every, all, that's what animals did. And we've kind of, you know, a lot of us have forgotten that now we just use animals for recreation like our horses or barrel racers or, you know, ropers or whatnot. But, you know, animals are useful. So um, uh, one of my horses is actually broke to drive. This is not one of mine, but um, I just, I don't know how to do it. I don't have a cart, you know, I don't know how to, I don't know how to drive a horse, um, but it's something that's kind of on one of, on my list, you know, that I want to learn. Um, so it's a kind of a cool thing, you know, to have your horse that can pull a, um, pull a cart or pull a wagon. Um, again, just like trucks, you know, they have the, your payload capacity and then your towing capacity. So it's the same with horses, but they can carry on their backs is much less than what they can pull. Um, and so, you know, uh, pulling a wagon or pulling a cart, you can, you can haul a lot more stuff than you can with um, putting something on their back. 
and oxen and you know all that all that stuff i'm i'm sure you could probably even hook up your goats to a little <laughs> maybe not the chickens but i think the goats could probably pull a little cart so anyway how the animals can help us in our long-term preparedness so um livestock just talked a little bit about this you know if you travel anywhere in like south america or mexico you know any kind of a developing country i mean this is still how it's done this is how they plow their fields you know they they use the oxen and and they have a plow and um that's that's the way they do it uh you know, Fred was telling me about his ancestral history in this area where he didn't have any pictures because, of course, they didn't have pictures back then. But um, there was a tale in one of the written journals about hooking up a horse and an oxen next to each other to do the plowing. So, you know, you just sometimes have to think outside the box, right? Yeah. So, um, in the again in those kind of more developing countries they tend to use the bigger animals the horses and the oxen for work and less for food um and why why do you guys think that is anybody have an idea they're stronger they can make more food yeah 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 exactly if you were to butcher a big cow without refrigeration boy that's a lot of work you got to make jerky you got to smoke it you know that's a that's a lot of work um and so without refrigeration a big animal you know you're going to have a party and all of diamond valley is going to eat um because yeah it's going to be a lot of work to preserve all that food so uh, let's go to our next topic which is coming it's coming <laughs> there <laughs> how to how to have food um without you know how to preserve food when you don't have refrigeration or freezer well you keep the animals alive you have small little animals you know bunnies chickens goats animals that can produce a product that you can eat like eggs or milk um or a small animal again um things we sometimes think that think of as pets in South America, they have them as food, like guinea pigs and bunnies, but they keep them small. And then when they need a meal, they butcher one and it's small and or two and it feeds the family and, you know, they reproduce quickly. So you get a lot more um, and you don't have to worry about preserving it because the preservation is in that they're alive. So that can be, you know, something to think about uh, if, if it comes to the to the point where we don't have freezers and refrigerators anymore. Oops. All right, so we talked about how the horses drink like 10 gallons of water a day and probably more than that in the summer around here, honestly, that's an average. But um, are we going on to the next one? So you can get your thing over there. There we go. Um, so in my mind, if my horse, my horses are going to drink 30 gallons of water a day and, you know, you're going to ask me why are your horse is drinking so much water when, you know, we just need two gallons for our family. Well, they better earn their keep. That's, that's what I feel like. They're not going to be little recreational horses for me to ride around anymore. They're going to have to, they're going to have to do some work. So, um, Anybody, um, well, that's me. Anybody know who this is? Who this horse is? Any, any military people? Any military people in the in the uh, audience? Yeah, but not that far back. Not that far back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's a sheep. She's my favorite marine. Yeah. Yeah. So this is well. She retired as a staff sergeant when she was in the Korean War. Her she was sergeant reckless. So this is staff sergeant, a statue of Staff Sergeant Reckless, um, a Marine who was in the Korean War, won like Purple Hearts and all kinds of accommodations. I mean, she was, you know, pretty famous. Um, but they bought her, the, the Marine unit, um, somebody in the Marine unit uh, bought her, uh, she was a racehorse, a Mongolian racehorse. She was four years old and they purchased her to use as, to train her as a pack horse. 
Well, she just roamed free around camp. Like she became kind of one of the fellas, you know, she'd go in their tents at night to sleep if it was cold. She was like famous for eating weird things like scrambled eggs and she would drink their beer and, you know, just be like, again, like she was one of the guys. She's like, hey, I'm a Marine now. So, but her claim to fame, and this is what's so cool about animals, she stepped up for her comrades in arms when they needed her. She would go without a handler. She would take herself up and down the supply routes, you know, in a combat zone from the bait, from down at the bottom. They would load her up with, you know, re, they would put ammunition and, and stuff on, on the pack on her. She would take it up by herself, resupply the guys who were fighting up at the top of the hill. They would unload it. They would send wounded back down with her to camp. The one she got the medal for, she did 51 trips without a handler, taking ammunition up, bringing wounded back. She was one of the guys. You know, she was one of the Marines. She did her job. She stepped up and she's like, I'm going to help out my buddies. And so don't underestimate, you know, what your animals can do if, if, push, if you know, when you need them. Yeah. So. Um, and Kathy, to that point, yes, they have an intuition we don't have. I just heard a story this last weekend oh, yeah. about a horse in a snowstorm that stopped at the edge of a cliff, wouldn't move forward. And finally, after praying, the owner said, okay, just let go, turned and went straight to the cabin. Because they trusted the horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's awesome. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, and you guys might have other stories like this. I, years ago, when I was first a veterinarian, I broke my collarbone and I couldn't work for like a week. And I had this cat, the cat never hunted before, never hunted a day after. But for that week that I was home from work, that cat brought me something every day, <laughs> brought me a mouse, brought me a snake, you know, was providing for the family. I mean, it was literally never hunted before, never hunted after. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. He was trying, he was doing, he was trying his best. So yeah, they, you know, sometimes you just have to trust your animals that they might know what, what to do. Um, this other picture over here, this one, is just um, a nice piece of kit to have if you have horses. Um, you could um, use the same thing, you know, like dog packs, or you could use a dog pack on a goat. They make goat packs. You can get these things for all kinds of livestock. But that's called a saddle pannier. So, you know, it just fits over your regular riding saddle, so you don't have to have a pack saddle and all that, you know, that you're never going to use again, or you might not use down here. But with everybody in the valley that has horses, the saddle panniers are a nice piece of kit. I mean, you can get them new anywhere from like 50 to 100 bucks. They're not that much. And, uh, you know, they hold a lot. So, yeah, if you've got to haul firewood or, or water or, you know, you killed a deer and you want to pack it home, um, that's a great little piece of kit to have. Um, so that brings me to our next topic. Um, oh, we talked about this, how much water horses consume the saddle panniers, uh, pulling a plow. So again, if you find yourself in a situation where, oh, I meant to buy those saddle panniers and I just hadn't gotten around to it yet. And now I've got to haul water. What am I going to do? So, you know, again, you got to kind of think outside the box. What have you got around the house? You got a big garbage bag and you got some baling twine. So fill up your, fill up your garbage bag with some water. Tie it with some baling twine. This is a picture of a Miller's knot, which is a cinching knot, so it gets tighter as you pull on the ends. And uh, pick it up and put it on your horse. So there's the horse with the uh, with the garbage bag full of water. Well, it's a little dark, but uh, anyway, yeah. You just took the garbage bag full of water right here and uh, tied it to the horn of the horse and off we go. Um, you can stop, you know, if you're worried about it catching on a bush or something and, you know, puncturing a hole in your garbage bag, stick it in your 30 pound empty dog food bag or a grain sack. You know, just, you can use the stuff you've got around um, to do some of these things. So 
you know, I save all my baling twine. I don't know if anybody else does, but I always feel like it's going to be useful for something. <laughs> yeah, so save, you know, save a few old dog food bags. Um, never know what it might come in handy for. Um, so our next topic is a word of caution. You, you might not want to just go ahead stick, sticking these things on your animals without doing a little preparation. Even a broke horse is broke to ride but might not be broke to pack and it won't take very long. You know, it might take you 20 or 30 minutes to prep them but just be aware that they're not going to like something flopping on them. Uh, they go into a trot and something is loose and flopping up and down on their sides that's not going to be what they're used to. They uh, have to figure it out for themselves, like how to go through gates, how to go around trees, because you're not up there guiding them. Now they're now you're leading them, or or you know they're they're following another horse or whatever. So they they have to figure these things out for themselves. So this is how I started training my pack horse. I went down to the Chevrolet dealer and uh, asked them for some old tires, and they looked at me like, "Why do you want old tires?" And I said, "Because I'm going to train my pack horse." So you want to start with something soft and that can move and not break and because when they go through a gate they're going to catch it on something and they're going to freak out and they're going to be like oh my god you know so you just got to take a little a little time to to train them so this is my round pen back in uh, montana and he's just getting used to carrying the weight and having things flop on him oh good boy <laughs> <laughs> He's like, okay, go the other way. Go there way. you go. Try. Good boy. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> there, now he's relaxing about it. Good boy. <laughs> and then, uh, just to show you guys. Okay, come here. Oh, come here. We ha come what here. happened to the, do we have the other? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that was a that was a brief uh, thing of me building a travoy for my dog. <laughs> he didn't like it. He kind of scared him. Ready for this one? Okay, yeah. So we'll go back to the horse. So I think I probably have um, dog food in the panniers right now, like the sacks of dog food. Again, just to get him used to the weight and uh, the used to the flopping. And I kind of let the straps flop and. You know, just let them get used to that kind of stuff. So, you know, don't just assume because you have a broke horse that they're going to be okay with packing. You might have to do a little prep um, for that. So be safe. Be safe and don't, and don't uh, start small. Same thing with the dogs. Uh, here's a picture of a dog with a little travoy. So um, this is a very traditional way of um, moving items um you know the native americans use dogs a lot to with travoy to uh, move camp and again the same principle applies they can pull more than they can carry on their backs they're pretty easy to make again that one where you saw the video with my dog with a couple pine tree limbs and baling twine yay baling twine um you do have to have a harness or something on the dog to attach the travoy to but um, and start small. They're not going to like it at first, but you know, be patient and and uh, they'll learn. They can figure it out. You know how to um, how to be comfortable with with pulling things. So they can pull firewood. Um, you know, you can have the dog packs on them to carry things like that, firewood and little the little small bottles of water. Um, but the dogs for long term preparedness. Again, we talked about warmth. Protection is a big one right? They're going to be your alarm system, right? From who knows what, mountain lions, coyotes, people predators. Um, they, my dogs have a, they have a different bark, you know, for where there's a bear versus when there's an intruder. I can usually tell the difference between when the UPS guy shows up and when there's a bear or something <laughs> in, bad in the neighborhood. So, you know, get to know what your, what your dog's alarm system is. The other thing that um, is kind of interesting with dogs is sometimes you want them to bark and alert you. Sometimes you might not want them to bark. And so you can train your dog to be quiet and to not bark if, if you're trying to be, you know, stealth about something. I mean, who knows why, but maybe you're trying to be secretive and uh, you don't want the dog to, um, you know, to give away your location 
in the house, right? Because there's an intruder. You want to you want the intruder to, <laughs> to like, you know, be wandering through the house and then the dog to surprise him. Or maybe you want the dog to bark and scare away the intruder. But anyway, it's a good thing. It's a good thing for your dogs to know when to be quiet and when to bark. So that's something you can, another thing that you might want to play with as far as training goes. And then of course, just companionship. You know, if we're stressed out and, you know, life's not the same as it used to be, well, your dog doesn't care. Your dog is going to love you and wag their tail anyway, right? And so they can be just a great stress reliever and good companions. Yeah. So. Can they make the harness for dogs to do this or you have to make your own? Well, when I did it, I just put them uh, on the dog pack. The dog pack, you know, is kind of like a harness. So use the dog pack and then put the travoy on the dog pack. They make like uh, ski during harnesses for dogs. Do you know what that, what ski during is from down here? <laughs> well, it's um, like a dog sled, you know, like picture the Iditarod. It's a, it's a harness like that for pulling a dog sled. But in ski during, you know, the dog just pulls you, you're on skis and the dog pulls you on your skis. But they make those kinds of harnesses that you could also use for a travoy. Yeah, or you could, make your own out of bailing twine. <laughs> okay, let's see. I think that's all we had to talk about there. And kitty cats. <laughs> kitty cats, same thing, you know, a little warmth, little companionship, little purring action, good mousers, good varmint control, uh, snakes, mice, what other kind of var vermin do we have in this area? Pack rats? Do we have pack rats? Ground gophers, voles, yeah. Yeah, all the whole thing, the whole nine yards. Yeah, yeah. So cats can be very useful for keeping that kind of stuff down and, you know, keeping them out of your, your grain that you have stored or your animal feed that you have stored. Um, yeah, cat kitties can be very useful that way. And they're pretty smart. They know. They know you need help. Okay. Okay, so the caption says, when you have to conquer Mongolia, but the cat needs a walk first. <laughs> I just found this so funny. I was like, really? <laughs> anyway, this is my little slide for you to remember. Uh, just, just picture this when, you, when you're stressed out and you can't decide what to do. Just remember to prioritize. If you're fighting a war, you don't need to walk the cat. So anyway, I guess that's the end of my talk. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Oh, thanks. Thank you. Good. Oh, good.